Thank you, John and Mike and Craig, for leading us in musical worship this morning and getting our focus on the themes that we will explore in Galatians chapter 6. You know, it's been a real joy to uh, preach the book of Galatians. I think I've preached 10 out of 14 messages over the last number of weeks, and it's been a real joy to do that. Thank you for coming to church each Sunday, and uh, I pray that God will have used the book of Galatians to profit all of us as his people over the course of this time. I am looking forward to jumping back into uh, Exodus as Sean leads us through that uh, this coming fall. Why don't we pray for God's help as we open up his word to Galatians chapter 6. Lord, you know that I do not come proclaiming the testimonies of God with lofty speech or wisdom this morning. But Lord, I desire that what would be known to all of us this morning is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I stand behind this pulpit weak in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message at times might be implausible. But Lord, all of this is to demonstrate your power so that our faith as a congregation might not rest on the wisdom of man, Caleb's oratory ability and charisma, but rather in the power of God. And so do that among us, O Lord, this morning so that your Son is exalted, so that The Spirit's work is palpable to all of us as we hear your words preached. Do it for your glory and the good of your church. We all pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a profound parable that I first heard in 2018 from H.B. Charles. And he tells the story of a historic church located downtown in a major city, And written on the outside of the wall, the church's wall, for everyone to see as they walk by or they drove by, were the beautiful words that Pastor Sean read for us earlier from 1 Corinthians 1.23. We preach Christ crucified. And Charles says that as a period of years goes by, ivy starts growing up the side of that church wall. And as more years pass, the ivy actually grows over the last word in that phrase such that all that the phrase says is, we preach Christ. And then over time, nobody notices. And the ivy continues to grow such that it is now over top of that second last word in the phrase, And all that passerbys can see are the words, we preach, and nobody notices. Charles laments that this parable speaks about the state of so many churches today. The preaching and ministry of the church becomes about something other than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The the church becomes consumed with other messages, messages of social justice, partisan politics, self-help, health and wealth. Messages become motivational. Preaching becomes what's palatable to the people. Programs become about entertainment. And it goes on and on, and the ivy grows over the words, and all that can be seen there is we preach. It happens slowly, but it obscures the most important message of the church, Christ crucified. The same can happen in our individual lives. We can so quickly become about something other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified, Friends, how many of us are in danger of ivy overgrowth as we assess our lives by the following phrase? We boast in Christ crucified. 
Sometimes the ivy of the world, the ivy of distraction starts to grow up over those last three words, in Christ crucified. And all that we can see marking our lives is that phrase, we boast. And do we ever boast? We boast in our athletics. We boast in our academics, our appearance, our associations, our opportunities. We boast in our position, our power, our possessions. We can boast in our family and friends inordinately. We can boast in our wisdom and in our wealth and our gifts, in the way that we serve, in the way that we sacrifice, unlike other people around us. We boast in our discipline. We can boast in our piety. Oh, we boast. But how often is Jesus Christ and Him crucified the focus of our boast. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you these questions this morning. What is the motivating reality of your life? What gets you up in the morning? What animates you? What is your obsession? What do you live out of? What do you pump your fist at? What is your boast? Well, the Word of God reminds us this morning of a very basic truth, but a truth that is essential for the thriving of this church and for our growth in Christ. It reminds us of this, that our boast is in the cross of Christ. And boy, do we ever need this reminder. Because distractions abound. Look at the marketing of the world trying to distract us from what our boast is and telling us that we should boast in other things. We are prone to wander. And what we need is we need to be vigilant as the ivy threatens to cover over those last three words in that phrase, we boast in Christ crucified. And as we see the ivy growing up, oh, we need to chop it down by God's grace. We need to throw it in the fire so that the blazing statement of our lives is Caleb boasts in Christ crucified. Hespler Baptist Church boasts in Christ crucified crucified. That is what Paul closes his letter with to the Galatians. Nothing will help the Galatian church thrive more than remembering this central truth, and this truth is the same for us. So would you turn with me to Galatians chapter 6? I'll read verses 11 to 18. Here is then what Holy Scripture says. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Well, Paul has been earnest throughout this letter because the truth of the gospel is at stake. And throughout the letter, he has pressed the Galatians to remember a number of truths. Right at the beginning, as he opens the letter, he says to them, I I, I press you, I want you to know that there is nothing more precious than the gospel. And as he transitions out of his opening, he doesn't thank the Lord for them. He doesn't pray as he normally does because he is so urgent that this second truth come home to them. He wants them to see that when it comes to the gospel, there is nothing more serious. And if we add anything to the gospel, we actually take away from it. And that thing that is posing as a gospel of its own is really no gospel because it is no good news at all. And then as Paul continues his argument in the latter half of chapter 1 all the way into chapter 2, he presses home to the Galatians that the gospel that he preaches comes from God. It is not a man-centered or man-made gospel at all. Paul didn't invent it. It came to him from the Lord. 
He presses home to the Galatians that he wants them to remember that the good news of the gospel is grounded in this, that their justification, their standing in the sight of God is by faith alone and not by the works of the law. And he presses home to them then in this very theologically dense section, Galatians chapter 3 and 4, that this is how it has always been. He points them back to the Old Testament and he says, friends, this is how God has always worked. By faith alone, through grace alone. And finally, as Sean has taken us through Galatians chapter 5, he presses home to the Galatians that the Christian life is characterized by the Spirit. And now as Paul closes his letter, he takes up the pen. You see it in verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you. He is urgent. He puts his authority on the letter. This comes from me, Galatia. This is Paul's writing. I am earnest. I want you to know these truths. The gospel is at stake. Pay attention. I am writing in large letters. And he wants the Galatians to remember as he closes this letter that their boast is in the cross of Jesus Christ. In light of everything that I've said, know one thing, take one thing away with you. I'm writing it in large letters, boast in the cross of Christ. And to that end, he gives us three marks of boasting in the cross of Christ, which we'll survey this morning. Mark number one is this, boasting in the cross means rejecting works righteousness. Verses 12 and 13, boasting in the cross means rejecting works righteousness. Paul has been clear all along that to accept the law is to diminish the gospel. By adding the gospel, you, uh, by adding the law to the gospel, you actually take away from the gospel and you are left with no gospel whatsoever. So works righteousness must be rejected. And so Paul encourages the Galatians, throw it out throw it out. And as he encourages in this final exhortation, the Galatians to throw out this whole system of works righteousness presented by these Judaizers, he goes after the Judaizers' character, these false teachers' character. And notice three things about their character. So we're in point one, three sub points. We're looking at the Judaizers' character. He says, notice this about the Judaizers. Those who depend on the works of the law, those who depend on works, they are people pleasers. Look at verses 12 and 13 again in your Bible. The top of 12 says, it is those who want to make a good showing of the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And then look right at the end of verse 13. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may do what? Boast in your flesh. The Judaizers... The false teachers, these people who would add the law to what Jesus Christ has done, they are people pleasers. They are trying to make a good impression. They are trying to improve their rating and advance their reputation by strongly advocating circumcision, by getting the Galatians to adhere to their system of faith plus works They get to boast about all those who adhere to their teaching and authority. Look at this great following that I have. All these people have listened to my system of theology. And notice that the Judaizers are not misguided, just somehow misguided in their zeal for God. Paul does not say that they mean well, they mean to glorify God, they mean to obey God, but you know, their theology is a little bit off. No, they are characterized from first to last by a desire to please people. They want those who love Judaism. They want those who love Jesus plus the law to give them the thumbs up. Note this, friends. Works righteousness so often goes hand in hand with people pleasing. They're both performance-based. The same zeal that wants to work in order to be accepted by God is the same zeal that works to be noticed and praised by others. Works righteousness wants a pat on the back. Look what that guy's doing for the Lord. Look at how devout he is. Look at how pious he is. Did he just say two hours a day of prayer? Looking for a pat on the back. It wants others to recognize what, what you have done to please God. Works righteousness is a way of winning cheap accolades. 
And so those who depend on the works of the law are people pleasers. But then notice in the second half of verse 12 that they're not only people pleasers, they're actually persecution dodgers. Do you see the, do you see the language in there? Second half of verse 12, the Judaizers want to make a good showing in the flesh because they don't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ. They don't want to come under fire for the cross. Now, we don't know exactly what sort of pressure these Judaizers were under, but we can confidently say that they wanted to avoid any accusation that they did not adhere to the law. And what a tragedy that is. The Judaizers are not willing to take heat for the cross. The cross, which is the very power of God. Paul will say to the Corinthians, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Friends, the cross is offensive. It tells us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. It tells us that we cannot save ourselves. It actually tells us that we cannot lean on ourselves an iota, but we must lean on another with our full weight. All of our attempts to be right in the sight of God are completely futile. The cross is offensive, but it is the very power of God for salvation. And these men, these women who are depending on works are persecution dodgers, and they cheapen the cross. But thirdly, notice this also about this text. As we look at the character of these Judaizers, they're not only people pleasers, they're not only persecution dodgers, but you see it right at the beginning of verse 13. They are lawbreakers. The very people who promote circumcision and adherence to the law are lawbreakers. Now, how can this be? Well, if you turn back to Galatians 3, verse 10, you read these words. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, Paul says, look, I say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he keywords here, is obligated to keep the whole law. Paul is pointing out the irony of the situation here, and it's this, that the very people most zealous about the law are themselves law breakers. Why? Because they cannot keep the whole law. They fall short of perfection, and any step short of perfection leads to condemnation. Think about this. Attempting to be saved by Christ plus works is like trying to walk to the grocery store by stepping onto your treadmill and turning it on. You're, gonna, you're not going to get an inch closer to your grocery store. You're just going to walk around and around. You're going to walk, 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 walk. You, you can't even get up to the stairs on that thing. You can't get to your neighbor's house on that thing. But adding the law to what Jesus Christ has done is that futile. It is that Silly, the very best of our deeds are riddled with sin and we cannot possibly measure up to the fullness of God's standard, which is perfection. And so these very people who are advocating circumcision and the law, Paul says, they're lawbreakers. And so if we would boast in the cross, we must reject this whole system of works righteousness. We must rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We must cling to the fact that Jesus is all of our righteousness. Do you see what Paul's saying here in summary? These men are cocky. These men are cowards. These men are condemned. Reject their whole system. That's mark number one. Boasting in the cross means rejecting works righteousness. But you see in verses 14 to 16, Paul takes a turn and he gives the positive side of his argument. And he says, boasting in the cross does not just mean rejecting works righteousness. There's something positive to it. There's something to embrace. It means embracing our new status. Paul contrasts the boasting of the Judaizers with what the Christian should boast in. Now, one writer captures the meaning of the word boast in this way. And kids, I know you've got the word boast on your notes sheet, and so you're going to want to pay attention to this. This is our definition of boast. One writer says this, 
this is, there is no exact equivalent in the English language to kaukeomai, which is the Greek word. It means to boast in, to glory in, to trust in, to rejoice in, to revel in, to live for. The object of our boast or glory fills our horizons, engrosses our attention, and absorbs our time and energy. In a word, our glory or our boast is our obsession. The Christian boasts in the cross. Now, what a thing to boast in, a cross, an instrument of death, a sign of terror, a symbol of disgrace and shame. That's what the cross was for the Jews and for the Romans in the first century. It was the most horrible method, the most terrible method of slowly killing someone that was available. It's like saying, why don't we glory in the guillotine? Let us glory in the lethal injection. Let us glory in the electric chair. This is not something to boast in. Cicero, a Roman orator uh, around the time of Christ, once described crucifixion as a most cruel and disgusting punishment. He added, to bind a Roman citizen, a crime. To flog him, an abomination. To kill him, murder. To crucify him is what? There is no fitting words that can possibly describe a horrible deed such as that. Friends, Jews and Romans were terrified by the cross. It was a sign of humiliation, disgrace, and shame. So why should the cross be our obsession? Why, how can we boast in this instrument of torture? Well, we've got to answer this question. What is the cross? Well, the text tells us it's not any old cross. It is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that is in view here. Kids, I want to help you understand what the cross is this morning. We've got a section in your notes that has the word cross on it, and I want to help you define what Paul means when he talks about this word cross. And he doesn't just mean two slabs of wood attached together. It's not just the physical object of the cross. Oh, there's a whole load of meaning behind this word when he uses the word cross. Notice this first. The cross tells us about the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood for those who were rebels so that they might be restored to fellowship with their maker. The cross tells us about the love of God. The cross also tells us, though, about the justice of God. Sin is such an awful offense against the perfectly holy God that it must be dealt with. God will not shove sin under the rug. It will not just sort of vaporize because God decides to do nothing with it. God does not wink at sin. No, sin must be punished. Justice will be meted out and Jesus takes that punishment of our sin upon himself at the cross. It tells us about the justice of God. The cross also tells us, though, about the mercy of God. Paul writes to Titus, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. It tells us about the mercy of God. The cross also tells us, though, about the victory of God. You know what happens at the cross? Not just two slabs of wood attached together. Not just a man on the cross like any other man who would get put up on the cross for his crimes. No, 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 no. You know what that man is doing? That God man is doing? He is crushing sin, death, and Satan. His victory is is displayed as he hangs on Calvary's cross. Paul writes, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross speaks of victory. The cross also speaks, though, of forgiveness. Paul tells the church in Colossae that their sins have been nailed to the cross. Think about that, friends. If you are in Jesus Christ, You are a participant in what took place 2,000 years ago. As Jesus is nailed to the cross, your sins nailed to that old rugged cross. 
God canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The cross tells us about the forgiveness of God. But the cross also speaks about purification. We are washed clean in the blood of the pure and spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Romans 9 tells us, For if the blood of goats and bulls, the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The cross is about purification. The cross is also about redemption. We are bought back. We are slaves to sin and we are redeemed, purchased by God. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The cross speaks of propitiation. Christian, learn that word. Propitiation. It's in our Bibles. We need to know it. It's not just a Christianese word that we sort of gloss over and go, oh, maybe one day I'll learn. Learn that word. It means that God is, easiest way to remember it, pro-us. God is for us. How is he for us? He, Jesus, takes on the wrath of God. God is justly angry at sin. He is justly wrathful towards sin. Jesus takes the wrath of God in our plates and he averts it. He appeases it. It is turned away from us. Why? Because Jesus takes it. That's propitiation. Learn that word. Know that word. God is pro-us. The cross speaks about justification. In the courtrooms of heaven, the great judge's gavel will hit the bench. And out of his mouth will come a sound. He will form words. The verdict will be given. And the judge of all the earth will say what about you if you are in Jesus Christ? Righteous. That's justification. We are declared right in the sight of God by virtue of what Jesus Christ has done. Our sin was imputed to him. He took it upon himself at the cross. And and his righteousness is then imputed to us. We are justified in the courtrooms of heaven. The verdict comes in. The gavel goes down. And God declares righteous. The cross is all about justification, folks. The cross highlights the peace That we have with God. Colossians 1.20 says that Christ made peace by the blood of his cross. Where there was once hostility. Where we were once enemies. Where we once spat in the face of God. Now there is peace and God has made it. He has initiated it. He has done it through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the cross, friends. And ultimately, and most importantly, when we speak of the cross, not just two slabs of wood attached together hanging on a wall in a church. When the Bible speaks about the cross of Christ, it highlights the glory of God. The most important aim of the cross is the glory of God in the salvation of sinners. Friends, when we come to Calvary, and when we see the Savior there hanging on the cross, we are confronted by the blinding light of God's glory as all of these benefits of the cross are displayed. That's why so many songs that we sing, sing of the cross. It is central to the gospel. It is central to salvation. It is central to our faith. It is central to the church's worship. It is central to everything. This is the cross, and we boast in it. All of our confidence, all of our hope is in the cross of Christ. The cross is our obsession because the cross is our salvation. And in these verses, God by His Spirit wants to direct our attention to the glorious change in status that has been brought about by this cross. And friends, I decided to limit my list to 11 things because I didn't want you to skip lunch today. God wants us to see that there is a change in status that has taken place and that we ought to embrace it. We ought to enjoy it. We ought to live out of it. Do you see the three descriptors of our change in status? There's one in 14, one in 15, and one in 16. First notice that because of the cross, 
We are a crucified people. The world has been crucified to us and us to the world. The world is just simply sinful humanity separated from God. And Paul says because of the cross of Christ, we no longer relate to the world in the same way. We have been crucified with Christ. We are no longer slaves to our passions and pleasures in this world. We no longer belong to the wicked world system that exists. In the cross, we have died to the values the systems, the pursuits, the pleasures of this world. We have trusted the crucified Savior. Our interest is in the eternal matters of the cross, not in the temporal matters of this world. And so Christian, because you are a crucified person, when sin and temptation comes knocking, where do you look? It is not just a cliche to say, oh, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to the cross. That can become so cliche. There's nothing cliche about it. You are a crucified individual. We look to the cross. We remember as the Apostle John says, ah, the world is passing away and all of its delights and all of its pleasures, but this, the cross of Christ, by which I am forgiven, by which I am propitiated to God, by which I am justified, and we go through the list. No, this is the greatest reality in all the world. And so next time sin and temptation comes knocking, look to the cross, friend. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a crucified people. Then notice verse 15. What's the change in status? We're not only a crucified people, we are a new creation people. Do you know what the prevailing burden of Paul is as he writes this letter? Yes, it's that the Galatians are in danger of losing the gospel. Yes, it's that, you know, righteousness before God It's by faith alone, not in the works of the law. But you know, as I've gone through this book over the last 14, 15 weeks, I thought this book is all about justification by faith. It is. It absolutely is. But you know what I'm thinking is one of the main themes of this book? Paul just wants the Galatians to understand, church, think about your new status. Think about this new era that has come in because Jesus Christ has died and has risen and a new age has come in and you live in the overlap of the ages. There's this present evil age, there's this age to come, you live in the overlap of them, but you belong to the latter. You belong to the age to come and you await it with great hope and with great expectation. Paul says, friends, remember this, you are a new creation people. The new creation has dawned in Christ. Embrace this. Don't go backwards. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul says, live out of that. We're crucified people. We're a new creation people. Thirdly, we are God's people. Verse 16, do you see that? As for all who walk by this rule... Peace and mercy be upon them and upon, or even upon, or that is upon, the Israel of God. Now this phrase, the Israel of God, does not refer to ethnic Israel. That would go against the teaching of the epistle as a whole. The entire epistle has taught that if you have faith in Christ, you are part of God's people. We are Abraham's offspring, Galatians 3, 7 to 9, by faith. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all, what? One in Christ Jesus. So Paul's whole argument is that the old distinctions which used to exist do not matter anymore now that Christ has come. We are all one in him. So this Israel here is not ethnic Israel. It is spiritual Israel. It is all those who belong to Jesus Christ by faith. If you are a Christian, behold this change in status. You are one of God's people. This is one of the premier promises of the Bible all throughout salvation history. Count this up in the Old Testament next time you're working through the Old Testament. What does God say? What is that premier promise? I will be their God and they shall be my people. What does Paul say here? If you are in Jesus Christ, if you know that circumcision doesn't count for anything, uncircumcision doesn't count for anything, then you are part of the family of God. You are one of God's people. You are destined for the new heavens and the new earth. And you know what the glory of the new heavens and the new earth will be? God will be there. Not weird angels with their harps on the clouds. 
Not all, I'll just get to, you know, fulfill my pleasures in any old way I want, but purified, sanctified, in God's presence, da 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 No, 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 the glory of the new heavens and the earth will be that we will see him face to face. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a well-known preacher in the 20th century. And he spent most of his time ministering at a, in a great pulpit at Westminster Chapel. He spoke to hundreds. He was a pastor in demand. He spoke, he spoke all throughout the week on Sundays twice, on Wednesday nights at Westminster Chapel. It was just, he was a well-known figure in evangelicalism. And he was sought after. People wanted him to speak. Well, as he got older, his capacity to speak grew smaller and smaller until all he could do in the latter days of his life was get out of bed and go over to his typewriter and type up some of the edits to the sermons that they were trying to publish of his, and then he'd get back into bed. That's all he could do in a day, just for an hour or two. And I believe it was his biographer, Ian Murray, who asked him, you know, Martin, how are, you, how are you dealing with this these days? What's life like these days? You know, you go from preaching to hundreds, being sought after, being the guy that everyone wanted to get, you know, to their pulpit. And now you just get out of bed, type for a bit, and go back into bed. How are you feeling about that? And Lloyd-Jones paused, and then he quoted a verse from Luke chapter 10, verse 20. The 72 disciples have come back. There have been signs and wonders as they've ministered to a bunch of different people. And they are ecstatic that the demons were subject to them in Christ's name. And Jesus responds to them and he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Lloyd-Jones's boast had not changed from his days of fame. His boast in those days had been that his name was written in heaven. And now as all he could do was a a couple hours of work a day, his boast was still in that very reality. Paul helps us to see that when we embrace our new status, we will be those who boast in the cross. And this new status, this, this boast It sustains us through the highs and through the lows of life. When we are dealing with a cancer diagnosis, it sustains us. When parenting doesn't seem rewarding, our boast is still in this, that our names are written in heaven, that Jesus Christ has died on the cross, that his work is finished. When our job seems to be going nowhere, when suffering strikes at every turn, when we're just discouraged everywhere we look, nothing has changed about our status. Our name is written in heaven. That's what Paul wants us to see. In this text, we are a crucified people, a new creation people, the very people of God. Friends, rest in that. Embrace that. Fill your sails with that. Let that be the grounds of your boasting. Well, there's one final mark of boasting in this text, and we see it in verses 17 and 18. Boasting in the cross means rejecting, works righteousness. It does mean that we embrace our new status. And thirdly, as we get down to these last two verses, boasting in the cross means suffering for Christ's sake. I find this closing tremendously helpful. these, These words really help to orient us. You see, following Christ, Paul admits, is not a walk in the park. Sometimes we think that the Christian life is gonna be easy. But boasting in Christ means that, you know, ah, we'll skip in a bed of flowers and the sun will always be shining upon us. But Jesus says we are bearers of the cross and Paul affirms this. Paul says, no, 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 it, it, is, it is a suffering thing to follow Christ. It is a hard thing at times to follow Christ. Look at the big long list of hardships in Paul's life in 2 Corinthians 11. He lists, I was in prison for the gospel. I was near death for the gospel. Whippings, beatings, shipwrecks, stoning. And on and on he goes. It takes up a good chunk of 2 Corinthians 11. The Christian life is not an easy life. Paul says in this verse 17, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Friends, has the cross made its mark on you? It will. Because it's not always an easy path. You may not be beaten and imprisoned for your faith. But there does come a time when we 
Are the recipients of rejection and ridicule, scored and contempt if we name the name of Jesus Christ? You might get fired or reprimanded for not wearing the LGBTQ plus pin during Pride Month. You maybe can't pronounce someone's new pronouns and there's a little bit of tension in the workplace or at school, a little bit of ridicule for the gospel. Or maybe your kids can't go to a birthday party because they're watching a movie that does not align with Christian values and standards. There's a few eye rolls. Or maybe you have to lovingly confront someone in their sin and it hurts the relationship, but you don't want them to exist that way. You don't want them to drift off ridicule and scorn for the gospel. Fidelity to Christ leaves a mark. And how do we keep naming the name of Jesus Christ when suffering is so acute? I mean, just think about this list that Paul goes through of all the things that he endured. How do we keep naming the name of Christ? How do we persevere when the trials are so unideal? You know, what what how do we how do we get through that moment when we just want to keep silent because we know that if we say something, no matter what we say, we'll be incriminated for the sake of the gospel? Well, Paul's closing blessing is our answer. He says it is grace that will sustain us through this time. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is one of the reasons I love the song Amazing Grace because it helps us understand that we're not merely saved by grace, but we are those who live off of the fuel of grace. We live by grace as Christians. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. We exist on the fuel of grace. It is grace that will bring us through these trials, inevitable though they are, hard though they are. It is grace that will help us to boast in Christ at these times. Church, we are turning 135 years old, October the 11th. And a couple of months before the church was organized, on October 11th, 1889, 30 people got together in someone's house and they were looking to discuss the startup of a church in the hamlet of Hespler. And Pastor Frank Beatty gave a message from the Word that day. We could say it was Hespler Baptist's first sermon. And the text he chose was Galatians 6, verse 14. May it never be that I should boast in anything, save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which I have been crucified to the world and the world crucified to me. It is my prayer that as we turn 135 years old, that God would preserve this lampstand, that it would be known as a church, that we would be known as a people who boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make it your prayer, Christian, that the ivy of worldliness, that the ivy of other messages would not grow over that statement, invisibly emblazoned on our wall. We boast in Christ crucified. But pray that our preaching and our teaching And the way that we function meaningfully as members together, the way that we love one another and serve one another and make meals for one another, the way that we function in our life groups, the way that we minister in midweek programs, the way that the elders meet and the deacons meet, pray that that statement would be emblazoned upon every single ministry of our church. We boast in Christ crucified. May that be who we are, not only today, but in decades to come, if the Lord should tarry. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you and we pray that you would write the truth of your word on our hearts and that you would receive all the glory for it and no man. We pray it for Jesus' sake and all God's people say, amen.